Hello, welcome back to Physics 272. Ah, this is to remind me that it's Halloween week. And, you know, Halloween is Friday, but we don't have lecture on Friday. So we're going to celebrate Halloween today. Um, in fact, I dressed in my Halloween costume. No, I won't make you guess. I'm a mad scientist. We look just like everybody else. So there you go. Mad scientist gig. Yes. OK. I, it's just fun. It's an E&M course. So if you don't get the Jacob's Ladder out during an E&M course, when are you going to get it out? All right, and that is about as much as that has to do with lecture. It's just for fun. But maybe I'll leave it up the whole lecture. I don't know. But the other thing uh, I have, because it's Halloween week, is some candy, because it's Halloween week, right? And like, yes, it's good to come to class. So take one and pass it along. If you have a peanut allergy, let me know. And I have some peanut free candy for you. OK, so take one and pass it along. Good to come to class. You just need one. OK. Good. OK. Happy Halloween. You're welcome. I love this thing, but it's noisy. So I'm going to turn it off. Now, now, while you're enjoying the candy, here's the scary announcement. Yeah. OK, so the scary announcement is that you have an exam, but you knew that. Here's how to study for the exam, OK? Um, at, at the point when it comes time to study, we're assuming you've already read the book and learned the material, OK? So at that point, when it comes time to study for the exam, I think I recommend the best thing to do is to solve problems. So what you want to do is solve problems. Uh, I have a practice exam up on, a web on a Blackboard Learn for you. Okay, the practice exam is there with solutions, with the actual equation sheet that you'll have on the exam. And I highly recommend that you take the practice exam before you view the solution set. Okay, so give yourself the best shot to use the practice exam as a diagnostic tool. Take it by yourself, you know, set yourself an hour and a half or something like that, and then find out how you actually did on it. And then that'll help you know which, ones, which uh, concepts you need to study. And then with the concepts you need to study, we've put every web assigned question that we have for chapter 17 and 19 on um, web assign available for you. They're not for credit, OK? But you get 50 tries for the questions. And you can basically just go in and practice the specific stuff that you need to practice. Do you have any questions about the upcoming exam? All right. Today, we're going to do this. We're going to solve for charge and current as a function of time in an RC circuit. And we're going to learn that the time constant, I'll tell you what that means, the time constant of an RC circuit is RC. R stands for the resistance in the circuit. C stands for the capacitance. OK? So what I'd like to do is think about a circuit that has a battery in it. OK, and I've labeled that by VEMF to remind us it's a voltage. It's a potential difference. Your book just calls it directly EMF. I'm going to call it VEMF uh, so that we know it's a, it's a voltage, potential difference. And then we have the capacitor here and something called a resistor. OK, now you've heard of a resistor before, of course. Um, we already know that the voltage drop across the capacitor is Q equals CV. OK, so I've put that above the line because it's stuff you already know. And there's a certain current that's going to be going through the circuit as it charges the capacitor, as it discharges the capacitor. But we know that that current is a function of time, right? So let me turn this guy on so you can see it. If we hook up this circuit, actually, I think, I think this capacitor is already charged. Let's just see. So when we hook it up, we see that the light bulb lights up, and then it kind of dims out. So this, what's going on here is that the current is a function of time. This, there I just discharged the capacitor, but let me, let me charge it. Okay, So what I have, I haven't closed the switch yet, but what we have here is a circuit that is exactly that, right? We have a battery, and then followed by a capacitor, followed by a resistor. The light bulb in this circuit is playing the role of the resistor because it is a resistive element. And the nice thing about the light bulb is that when it's got current th flowing through it, 
you can see it, okay? You can see that the light bulb is lighting up. And um, so now I flip the switch, you see that there's current going through it, which is while this capacitor is charging up. And then eventually the light bulb winks out. There, it just winked out and you can't see any light anymore. So this is the thing we want to analyze. It's exactly, it's exactly this setup right here, okay? And we have Q, charge, gathering at the capacitor. That's what we just did is charge this capacitor. And we'd like to understand that charging process, okay? Um, let me go ahead and discharge the capacitor, just so I know that all the capacitors over here are discharged. Okay, so that's our job today. Our job today is find Q of T. Q is at the capacitor. So what do we expect is what we should think about first. So the question here is, what do we expect in the circuit? So I want you to think about the potential differences in the circuit. This is the same circuit as that. It's the same one we're going to be analyzing today. I have a battery and then a, resist, um, a light bulb. The light bulb is playing the role of the resistor. And then I have the capacitor here. Initially, the ca capacitor is uncharged. We want to know which of these graphs shows the magnitude of the potential difference across the light bulb okay, while the circuit is charging. So while, while the capacitor is charging, which one of these graphs represents the potential difference across the light bulb as a function of time? OK, what are you thinking? What's the right graph here for the potential difference across the light bulb while things are charging? What's, what's, uh, what's a line of reasoning we need to think about in this circuit, about how things work here? And you can always tell me what your neighbor was thinking is fine. Oh, please, yes. OK. All right, so he's arguing that the potential difference across the bulb is proportional to the brightness of the bulb, OK? So the, the bulb is revealing for us um, the current going through it, right? So there's a current going through the bulb. And there's no current going through the bulb if there's no voltage. And if there's a voltage across it, then there should be current driving through the bulb and give us, um, give us current and give us the light coming from the bulb. So this is it. Yep. D is the answer we're looking for. OK. So the question is about the charging process itself. I haven't started anything yet. This capacitor is discharged at the moment. When I flip the switch, it'll charge. This is the exact same circuit as what's up there, a battery, a capacitor, um, a light bulb. And when I first turn it on, there's going to be a lot of um, current flowing through the bulb, right? And the only way there can be current flowing through the bulb is if there's a voltage di difference across it. Now, the, the current's dying out. As the current's dying out, the voltage difference is dying out, OK? And then here, when there's no more current, that's because there's no voltage drop across the bulb, right? So what happens throughout this circuit through time is that the, the largest voltage drop in the circuit is across the battery, okay? Or you can think of it as a voltage increase. And then the voltage drops across the capacitor and drops across the battery, okay? And then back at the battery again, then, um, then the voltage goes up, right? Voltage increases across the battery, drops across the capacitor, drops across the light bulb. Um, so when we first started things off, the entire potential difference of the battery is across the light bulb initially. Because if the capacitor starts off uncharged, there's no voltage drop across it, right? We have that equation for capacitors, Q equals CV. The mnemonic for that was quacks are covered, Q equals CV. So when the capacitor is uncharged, there can't be a potential difference across it. Okay, so initially, when I hook up the circuit, no potential drop across the capacitor means the entire potential drop of the battery is across the, the light bulb. Or in this circuit here, right, when I first start things off, the entire potential difference of the batteries is, a, is across the light bulb. And then, eventually, charge builds up in the capacitor, charge builds up in the capacitor. Q equals CV means that as that charge builds up, the voltage increases in the capacitor. Another way to think about it is that, um, you can also think about what happens here as, um, as the capacitor charges, the, this plate that's by the negative terminal of the battery, that plate will become negatively charged. This plate that's by the positive terminal of the battery will become positively charged. So once this whole line in the circuit is saturated with positive charges, there's no voltage drop left across the, um, the light bulb. 
Do you have any questions about that? All right. Okay. So this is what we were trying to figure out with that clicker question is what do we expect? If this is the, the um, circuit that we're analyzing, what we expect to happen is if initially the capacitor is uncharged, then just after we connect the circuit, Q, where Q is at the capacitor itself, right? Positive side has charge Q, negative side has charge negative Q. Right after we connect the circuit, there's no charge on the capacitor. And the entire voltage drop across the battery is, um, is not here, right? There's no voltage drop across the capacitor initially. So it's all here on the resistor, OK? This, in our test circuit here, the light bulb is playing the role of the resistor. So initially, the entire battery voltage is across the resistor. A long time afterwards, right, now the capacitor is charged up, OK? And it has Q equals CV. And a long time after we connect it, there's no more current running through uh, the, the light bulb. There's no more current running through anywhere in the circuit. So the current has died off. And that, if the, if the current has died off, then um, across the resistor here, there's no current across the resistor. There's no voltage drop across the resistor. All right? So that means that the entire voltage drop must be across the capacitor in the long time limit. So we end up with Q equals C V E M F, where that represents the voltage drop across the battery. Questions about that? OK. So what we'd like to do, our goal, is we would like to find Q as a function of time and I as a function of time in this circuit. It's called an RC circuit because there's a resistive element R and a capacitive element C. So there's one more concept we need in order to actually calculate um, the charge and the current as a function of time. The one more concept we need is that the current in this circuit is going to be dq by dt, where q is the charge on the capacitor. <coughs> right? So let's see why that's the case. So <clears throat> let me tell you first in English, and then we'll do the math for it. Um, so in, in English, we have this equation for the current. right? We know that the current microscopically speaking, is magnitude of charge on an electron times n times a times v. Remember, the little n is number of electrons per unit volume in the circuit. It's just uh, a number for, you know, for a particular metal. You would look up that density of electrons in the metal. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire, so thick wires okay, can carry more current than thin wires. V is the drift velocity of the electrons. Is there a question back here? No? Got it? OK? All right. So how much charge then passes by per unit time? How much charge delta Q passes by per unit time is in this equation? That's what that equation was all about, right? It's about charge per unit time passing by, charge per unit time passing by. So charge delta Q per unit time delta T means that in math, this current is delta Q by delta T, OK? Or in the limit of small time pieces, it's dQ by dT, all right? And another way to think about how is this going to go in our circuit is um, when we're charging this thing, actually, let's first discharge it, OK? So I'm discharging it just to get it back to its, its zero charged state, OK? You see how there's a, it takes a particular amount of time for that thing to, to die out. Um, OK, so now we'll go back to charging it. Okay, and what will happen is that once I flip the switch and we start charging this capacitor, there'll be a current running, right? Think of the current, think of the current as like uh, a water hose filling up a bucket, right? The current's going to run around carrying charge, and it's going to dump the charge into the capacitor, right? As the current gets to the capacitor, it doesn't cross the gap of the capacitor. The current gets to one side, and it starts building charge up on that side of the capacitor. So think of a water hose filling a bucket, okay? So here, we've got high current. Current's coming in, charge per unit time coming into the capacitor, but it's just bu building up. So one way, like if, if you had the situation where you were filling up a bucket of water with a water hose, if I didn't know how much water was flowing out of the water hose per unit time, I could watch the bucket, right? I could just tell you by watching the bucket. So let's say the bucket is some graduated cylinder, and I could say, oh, there's you know, a certain number of milliliters per second that the bucket is rising, right? That would tell me the flow of the water hose. Same idea here, OK? If I could watch the capacitor and see how the charge on the capacitor is changing per unit time, 
that tells me the current coming in. Okay, same concept. Do you have any questions about that? All right, this is, this is the major new concept that we need in order to calculate um, the charge as a function of time and uh, the current as a function of time. Any, any questions so far? Okay, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and discharge this guy just to, so that I know things are discharged. All right, so the charge delta Q per unit time moves through the circuit, but it piles up with the capacitor. This Q right here is the same Q that's gathering on the capacitor. Okay, and our goal, our goal is to find Q as a function of time and current as a function of time. The first thing we'll do is find um, Q as a function of time in the circuit. So I have up here, up top, the equations that you already know, right? If it's above the line, it's an equation you already know. We have Q equals CV, which represents the charge on the capacitor, and uh, C is the capacitance, V is the voltage drop just across the capacitor, right? Every time you see this equation, it's just the voltage drop across the capacitor. I is dQ by dt, that's our new equation. And I'll also use V equals IR, which is the voltage drop across a resistive element. So any resistive element R, okay, R stands for the resistance there, I can take the current times that resistance and it gives me the voltage drop across it. So here's our circuit we want to analyze, okay? On the left is the battery. There's a particular voltage that the battery supplies, and then there's a voltage drop across the capacitor and a drop across the resistor. So the first thing I'm going to do is apply the voltage loop rule, okay? So as I go around the circuit, over here on the left-hand side, I go up in voltage, right, due to the battery. So that's V EMF here. And then on the right-hand side, I'm dropping down in voltage. That's the right-hand side of this voltage loop rule. As I go across the capacitor, the voltage will drop a certain amount. And I can just look at Q equals CV to find out by how much. So the voltage drop across the capacitor is Q over C. So there it is, Q over C. Remember, Q is changing as a function of time, right? So I don't know what it is yet. We're going to solve for it. And then going across the resistor, the voltage drop across the resistor is IR. Okay. So now I'm going to, in place of the I here, oh, sorry, I guess I should ask, do you have any questions about how we applied the loop rule right there? It was just the, the voltage loop rule, that as you go around a loop, you have to come back to the same voltage. So here, uh, I'm going to, for the current, put instead dQ by dt, okay? So altogether then, this equation is V EMF equals Q over C plus dQ by dt times R, the resistance. And I just use that I is dQ by dt, all right? Do we have anybody in here who is a math major, used to be a math major, math minor, loves math for a hobby? Okay, all the math people are excited because at this point, we have a differential equation. And that's what we're going to do now is we're going to solve this differential equation and find out what Q is, all right? Now, big tip, all right. There's a difference between how you solve a differential equation in a math class and how you solve it in a physics class, okay? Um, when you're solving a differential equation in a math class, you will spend a long time proving all sorts of things about the types of solutions that are possible, and you'll prove things about uniqueness of solution, okay? That takes a while, and it's, it, there's a whole rigorous set of mathematics behind that. In, when you're in a physics class, um, the way you solve a differential equation is you go to the math department, knock on the door, and you say, hey, what's the answer to that? Okay? Because getting the answer to that takes a long time. So the way you solve the differential equation is you already know the answer. I just want to be real upfront with you about that because I can't tell you how many physics classes that I sat through as a student watching the professor say they were solving a differential equation. And I'm scratching my head going, it sure looks to me like you solved that by knowing the answer. Turns out that's what we do, okay? So we're gonna solve this equation by knowing the answer. That's how you solve a differential equation in the physics class, all right? So we're gonna know the solution already because we asked the, the math department. Let me get this into the right form though, right? Before you can knock on the door of the math department, you have to get it in the right form. So isolate dq by dt, okay? So to do that, I'm gonna divide everything by r and take the, the q over c to the other side. So that gives me dq by dt is V EMF divided by R minus, this guy goes to the other side and gets a minus sign, so minus Q over C divided by R is right there. And um, here, oh, sorry, this is the Q over C, so minus Q over C divided by R right there. 
The solution, okay, when you take this form of differential equation, this is the solution, okay? The solution is that it's some sort of decaying exponential, and the work that we have to do is to figure out what these constants are. So the solution to this equation with a 1 over RC in front is some constant times e to the minus t over RC, t is time, plus another different constant. And the work for us to do is to simply make sure that these constants match the physics that's going on. All right? So that's our work. We take this solution, plug it into that differential equation, and make it all work out uh, to make physical sense. So here's what we have so far. Here's the differential equation that we're going to solve. dq by dt is v emf over r minus q over rc. And we have the solution that we're going to try, which is q of t is some constant a times e to the minus t over rc plus constant. So step one for us is just try the solution. Okay? So step one for us, we want to know what dq by dt is if that's the solution. So take the left-hand side of the equation, dq by dt, and plug in that form. When you do that, so take the time derivative of this guy. The time derivative of a constant is 0. The time derivative of this guy, OK, all right, the time derivative of that guy is the constant a. Now to take the derivative of e to the minus t over rc, you pull the constants down in front. So there's a minus 1 over rc there times e to the minus t over rc. OK, does that make sense that that guy is the derivative of our trial solution? OK. Now uh, I look back at the trial solution and I see, OK, if I see an a e to the minus t over rc, I can rewrite that as q minus constant. So I'll do that. So a e to the minus t over rc, use that equation here, and I get q minus constant. Now at this point, um, OK, so let me rearrange it just a little bit more. Minus times minus is plus, so I get constant over RC. This guy is Q over RC. Okay? At this point, I just want to compare back to the original differential equation I had. Okay? So the original differential equation we had said that, OK, the left-hand side is dQ by dt. What's on the right-hand side is going to be V emf over R minus 1 over RC times Q. Notice we already got the 1 over RC times Q. Okay? That's because we use the right solution, all right? And then all I'm doing here is matching up the constants. So V emf over R must be equal to constant over RC. So this tells me that the constant must be V emf times C. Okay? So just to recap what we're doing, we're, half, we're halfway there. To recap what we're doing is we found a differential equation for the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. We asked the math department. They said the solution to that is an exponential. So we write down an exponential solution. We just need to find out what's this constant a in front and what's this additive constant to it. So we just found the additive constant here. Okay. So the second thing we do, so step one was try the solution. Step two is apply boundary conditions, it's called. Okay. What we mean by boundary conditions is think of the extremes of the situation. This is a problem in time. So the extremes in time are when I initially connect the circuit, that's t equals 0, and then a long time after the circuit has been hooked up, which is t equals infinity. So those are the two extremes for us. Let me think of the first one, which is t equals 0. So if I take q at t equals 0, and I take the solution that we're trying out, then if I put t equals 0 in there, I would get a, there's the a, times e to the 0, right? At time 0, this is going to be e to the 0, right? plus that constant. Well, we already know the constant is V EMFC. And e to the 0 is 1. Actually, anything to the 0 is 1, right? So here I get then that Q at time 0 is A, is a plus V EMFC. But what is the charge initially, right? If I'm just starting things off and the capacitor is uncharged and I'm going to hook it up to start charging it, what's its instantaneous charge when I first take it up? Yeah, nothing, because that's how we set things up, right? That's another way you know you've got boundary conditions going on. It's basically how you set up the problem. So the initial charge on the capacitor is 0. That means that this A, this constant A that we're trying to solve, is minus V EMFC. Okay? So these two things here are everything we needed to take this form that the mathematicians gave us and make it fit our physical situation. And now we know we have a solution to the problem. Okay? Do you have any questions about how that went?
Okay? So the way you solve a differential equation is by already knowing the answer. You know the other thing I should tell you about differential equations? Because I wish, I wish my math teachers had told me this. There's only like five. Serious. There's only about five differential equations that are going to come up and be important to you in your engineering or physics classes or science classes. So seriously, if you just kind of got the little cheat sheet right now of these are the five most important differential equations and memorize the answers, there you go. I just, that's, there you go. That's all you needed to know for differential equations. That's so not true. Anyway, but <laughs> that gets you, I'd say, like 80%. If you go by the 80-20 rule, there's 80% of, of, uh, of your differential equations uh, that you'll need in, in your field. OK, so we're trying to find Q of t and, and the current as a function of time. We already found Q as a function of time. We know these constants now. So let me plug them in, OK? We have that Q as a function of time then according to what we already solved, is um, a times e to the minus t over rc. We found that a is minus v emfc, so I plug that in. We also found that that constant here, OK? I'm going to rearrange this. I have a v emfc in front of both terms, so I'll pull that out. That gives me q as a function of time is v emfc times this guy gives me 1. This guy gives me minus e to the minus t over rc. So that's it. We have officially physics style, solved this differential equation because we've gotten now Q of t that has the right mathematical form. Okay, it has the mathematical form that is known to solve that type of differential equation. And we've got all the constants fixed so that it matches our physical situation. And that's, that's it. Now we double check. Okay, Let's double check that this is what we expected. Actually, you may not recognize that right away. So. Um, let me, let me scribble something for you. OK. So for, um, so we have Q is some constant times 1 minus e to the minus x. OK, let me just remind you how the function goes, right? If I have f of x equals e to the minus x, then e to the 0 is 1. So it starts off at 1 and then it decays off exponentially, OK? We don't quite have that. We have something different. Now, if I take, if I continue this down to the other side here, and I say, well, in my equation, I have a minus e to the minus t over something, OK? This right here is what minus e to the minus x looks like. I just reflected it, right? And then if I add a 1 to it, right, this was matching up here at 1, so now, Take this and plus 1, everything is going to move up by 1. This was minus 1. So it all moves up to here. Okay? So there's the function 1 minus e to the minus x, is that black line. Okay? And that matches, okay, there it's just plotted out directly, that matches what happens in this circuit. right? As I'm charging the capacitor, the charge on the capacitor increases with time. What we needed the mathematics for, what we needed the differential equation for, is to tell us the shape of it. So now we know the shape, okay? and we actually know how long it takes to charge the thing. Okay? So that was, that was it. We have solved for Q of t. Do you have any questions so far? All right. So the next thing we want to do is solve for the current as a function of time. So here's the equations we know so far. We already figured out what Q is as a function of time. There you go. And now, if we use that the current is dQ by dt, we can take the differential, right? We can take the derivative of this, this charge, and that'll give us the current. So let me just take the derivative of q as a function of t. The first term is a constant, right? So derivative of a constant is 0. So I need the derivative of the second term, OK? The v emfc comes straight down. There's a minus sign that comes straight down, too. What's in this square bracket is the derivative of e to the minus t over rc. So the constant comes down in front, minus 1 over rc times e to the minus t over rc. Now I can say minus times minus is plus. The c's cancel, and I get v emf over r times e to the minus t over rc. That's the current. OK, you have a question so far? All right. All right, and then we want to double check. Okay. Just taking the time derivative of this charge, we get this function, that the current as a function of time is v emf over r times e to the minus t over rc. Is that what we expected? Well, it's a decaying exponential. Okay. The nice thing about that is that 
If this is the current in the circuit, yes, we know that the current dies off with time. Okay? It also has included in it that the initial current is V EMF over R. That's what we built into the equation. So yes, this is what we expected. Do you have any particular questions about that? Okay. So what we did was we took the differential equation of an RC circuit, used the voltage loop rule. The loop rule was what gave us the differential equation. right? We used the idea that current is dq by dt in that circuit. And then we solved all of that. Okay. All right. So here's the summary of, of this kind of circuit on charging. Right. So this is as we're charging the circuit, uh, as we're charging the capacitor. The charge increases with time. The current decreases with time, which of course matches our physical situation. Right. So this is a discharged capacitor, but what we just calculated is exactly what we've been observing in the circuit, that the current will start off high and then trail off and be low. And then as we're doing that, we're charging the capacitor. Okay? So the current starts off high and then it trails off to be low. Right? And all the while, we're, we're charging the capacitor. RC tells us something about how long that takes. Right? There's a certain amount of time it takes for that light bulb to wink out. Okay? And um, let me just discharge it real quick. Turns out to be symmetric when you're, when you're discharging it. It also takes about the same amount of time to, to discharge. This was the big capacitor. Okay. If I do the same thing with this smaller capacitor, the smaller capacitor is about half. The big one's 1 farad. Uh, the little one is uh, 0.7 farad. Okay. So this guy, being a smaller capacitor, charges up more quickly. It just it has less. As a smaller capacitor, it has less capacity to hold charge, so it fills up faster. So you see that the light bulb winked out pretty fast. Okay. What I'm showing you is that the time scale of the smaller capacitor is shorter than the time scale of the larger capacitor. And that's actually encoded in this RC right here. Okay. So the time constant, the time constant is telling you how long it, that, that process takes. And it's this RC. So let me, tell you, um, let me tell you a little bit about getting that time constant out. Okay. So we have, this is basically the equation. Um, this, is, this is like our, our um, charge, right? This was equal to our charge over V EMFC. Okay. Now, and then the current itself was, um, this one right here, the blue, is like the current, right? So this one is like, uh, is like the current, right? It dies off. Now, the math people are going to be so excited about today. Um, do you remember how to take a Taylor expansion of e to the x? All right. Oh, no, really? I'm telling you, there's like maybe two or three Taylor expansions you need to remember. e to the x is a good one. So it's approximately 1 plus x plus x squared over something or other, OK? We only care about the first two terms. <laughs> if I do this for e to the minus t over rc, okay, I get 1 minus t over rc plus t over rc squared plus stuff. All right. Look at the units of that term, though, okay? t over rc. Look at the units of this term. What's, what's the units of 1? Nothing, right? 1 is a number, okay? Does that make sense? That one is a number, right? No units on it. T over RC must also be unitless for this to work out, right? If there were units to this, then there'd be units to this as well. Okay. So the lesson here is that you can't, you can't exponentiate, or rather, do not exponentiate. It is against mathematical law to exponentiate anything with units. Whatever's up here has to be unitless. Otherwise, you get a contradiction. Okay? So when you see this e to the minus t over rc, that tells you that rc has units of time. Okay? So rc has units of time, and it's controlling for you how quickly this thing um, winks out. Right? Tells you about how long it takes things to happen. So if I tell you rc, that tells you something about the time scale of these things. All right? Or another way to see it is that 
um, the reason why RC is the time constant. If I take e to the minus t over RC and I put in time equals RC, then I would get e to the minus 1, which is 1 over 2.718 other stuff, which is approximately equal to 0.37. So when the brightness of the bulb has gone down by about a third, that's what we call the time constant. Okay? But it tells you basically how quickly things wink out. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. The, oh, I pushed buttons. Lovely. This is a good trick, I'm telling you. You can't exponentiate anything with units. That helps you keep your math correct. So what's the value of RC? Right? You can also then read it off of a graph. So if I gave you a graph of current versus time, the way that you could read off the RC constant is you would look at, well, when is the current decreased by a factor of 1 over e? Right? When it's decreased by a factor of 1 over e, then I read off that corresponding time off the graph. That's RC. Okay? So it tells you roughly how long it takes for that to happen. Do you have any questions so far? All right. You now know enough physics to, I've, I've now taught you enough physics, to solve this supposed clicker question. Remember this clicker question we had in lecture last time? And um, it's a clicker question I got from another professor who used to teach this course. But when we did the clicker question, we discovered it's way too complicated. OK, so that's why I've, this is not appropriate for clicker questions. So we're not going to take data on it right now. Not a good clicker question. But let me at least show you how to solve it, OK? So let me go through for you what's the physics involved with, with solving this, all right? So we have, well, we, we, we have enough information now. We know that in this capacitor, the question here was, we have two capacitors, a small one and a large one, OK? What we'd like to know is what's the fringe field a short time after um, we've started charging them. So they're initially discharged. We're going to start charging them um, a time 0.01 seconds after charging. So we know that one of the things we need to take into account is the form of the fringe field. Okay, this S is the spacing. R is the radius of the disk. Okay, A is the area of the disk, right? Q over A. But we now know that Q is a function of time. That's why this was too hard for a clicker question. So we have that the charge itself right, is V EMF C times 1 minus E to the minus T over RC, okay? And what we want to do here is find out, well, how much charge is on that capacitor at this time? T equals 0 0.01 seconds, all right? According to when we were working with this circuit here, okay, 1 one hundredth of a second, right, 1 one hundredth of a second is really short compared to this guy, right? The one we had would take maybe three seconds, maybe five seconds to wink out. So a hundredth of a second is clearly much smaller than the time constant of a typical RC circuit. Does that, does that make sense? It should match the intuition you have from the circuit we've been playing with. So this is much, much less than the time scale of the circuit. Okay? If that's the case, then okay, implies I can take a Taylor expansion of the exponent, e to the minus t over rc. Okay? It's approximately equal to 1 minus t over rc plus constants. All right. Now I'm just going to plug that back into here. And that'll give me that the charge on the capacitor, when I first start charging it, a short time after starting to charge, I would take V EMF times the capacitance times, in the brackets, I have a 1 minus, well, now I want to use this um, approximation for the exponential. So I have a minus 1 is the first term, so minus 1. Then I have a minus times a minus, OK? So that gives me a plus T over RC plus dot, 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 OK? The, the 1 cancels the 1. So then this charge, charge is a function of time on the capacitor, is V EMFC times, here I have T over RC. Okay? Now, the capacitance, this is nice, the capacitance cancels. Okay? I, otherwise, if it hadn't canceled, I'd have to look up, well, what's the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor? You do know that, okay? But we don't actually need it to solve the problem. So we have V EMF times time over R. That's Q as a function of um, time. I'm going to call this R here 
our bulb, all right? Because I want to remind you that this is the resistance of a bulb. It's not this guy here, which is a radius, right? So back to our question here, who's got the larger fringe field, okay? So E fringe is, I'm going to just read it off of there, I have Q over A over 2 epsilon naught times S over, in place of that bigger, I want to make it clear this is a radius. So I'm going to put R disk, okay? So that's the radius of the disk. Now, you also know that the area of the disk, right? It's a disk. It's the area of a circle. Thanksgiving's coming up. You've got to be thinking about pies, right? Okay. Area, the, area, the area of a pi is pi r squared. Okay. So pi times uh, the radius of the disk squared. So we're almost there. S Q over 2 epsilon naught. I have an R disk. I have an R disk squared. I need a pi. There's the pi. I have three powers of R disk. All right. But Q is a function of time. All right. So now this is going to be pi s. Q is a function of time we said was V E M F T over R bulb over 2 epsilon naught R disk cubed. Whew. All right. That's why that was too hard to be a clicker question, in my opinion. All right. But we've solved it. <laughs> That's the fringe field, a short time. Okay, short being if you're looking at a time scale that's very small compared to RC. So looking at a time scale that's short compared to RC, there's what the, the fringe field would be. So now we can get back to this question was um, the fringe field of the smaller capacitor all right, is greater or the fringe field of the larger capacitor is greater. So it depends simply on the, on the radius of the thing. All right, The smaller fringe field, um, let's see, the larger the disk, the smaller the field. So it's this guy, it's B, that the fringe field of the smaller capacitor is greater. Not that I'm taking data, it was too hard of a question. But the thing is that we needed the fact that the capacitance is canceled as well, and you needed the time constant. So hard problem, but now you know how to solve it. Okay, we'll see each other on Monday. <laughs>